simple hand tools to gargantuan machines. Along with high-powered explosives, we have literally moved mountains and sifted through the earth beneath our feet. In the last hundred years, we humans, using new inventions, have moved more cubic yards of Earth than our predecessors did in the previous hundred thousand years. At any given moment, there are major Earth-moving projects in progress all over the globe. On the south side of Las Vegas, the fastest growing city in America, the hills are being readied for a new residential neighborhood. This particular project, which is one of the major projects we have going in the Las Vegas Valley right now, currently has uh, just under 100 pieces of equipment that varies from very large bulldozers to small bulldozers to motor graders to scrapers and quite a few water pulls for dust control. All the material up here on the hill stays in the, in the construction region. Some areas have large cuts, other areas have large fills. Cutting soil from one area and banking it in another area in a compacted state so they can build houses up here. The American Asphalt and Grading Company uses trucks, some capable of hauling up to 100 tons in a single load, to transport the earth from where it's being cut to where it's needed to fill. One of the most challenging things we're running into is the type of soil. As you can see behind us, it is very rocky and very difficult to dig. That's why two Komatsu D575A-2s, known as Super Rippers, were brought to this site. They're the largest and most productive ripping and dozing machines in the world. These machines have an operating weight of around 336,000 pounds, are over 40 feet long and 16 feet tall. The basic ripping function is to be able to put your ripper point below the material. You need to penetrate that material by lifting the rear of the tractor. Uh, once you are into the material, we pull that ripper forward using a Komatsu 12V 1050 horsepower engine. Super rippers can be equipped with up to three ripper blades, called shanks. In the very rocky terrain of the Las Vegas housing project, there's too much resistance to rip with three shanks, so only one is being used in this application. When these machines are done ripping, uh, they will move the material using the 78 cubic yard blade uh, into the correct location. Uh, one of the primary differences in earth moving equipment today and 25 years ago when I entered in the industry is the complexity of the equipment and the productivity of the equipment. The older equipment was a lot simpler but not nearly as productive as the equipment we have today. The equipment itself is much more user-friendly for the operator. The creature comforts are incredible now compared to what they used to be. At the site of another future housing development in Southern California, the Sukut Construction Company also has to contend with a rocky environment, presenting the same challenges as those encountered in Las Vegas. One of the special pieces of equipment they've chosen to help accomplish the task is the Caterpillar 5130 Excavator. We love this tractor just for its efficiency. It's, it doesn't require a lot of support when you're running this tractor. It's self-contained. These are your control pedals. You can either move it forward and backwards by feet or you can do it by hand, whatever one is more comfortable for you at the time. Uh, this is your hoist for the bucket. It makes the boom go up and down. And then it also curls the bucket in and out. The 5130 excavator weighs in at a hefty 400,000 pounds and can load a truck capable of holding 100 tons of material with just a few shovel loads. It has a 13.6 cubic yard bucket and it'll lift the 30 to 35,000 pounds. We can dig approximately six to 8,000 cubic yards of dirt a day with this tractor. This excavator has been outfitted with two antennae to pick up signals from Global Positioning System satellites. 
Using GPS-based computer technology, the operator can determine exactly where and how much to dig. The operator, all he has to do is look at the computer screen to know where he is, grade off the light bars, and he doesn't need a person telling him where to grade. And from a safety standpoint, that's pretty beneficial as well. Overall, this project demands the movement of over 4 million cubic yards of Earth. If you were to take the operation that you see behind me running, which is about 15,000 yards a day, if it assumed that uh, a man and a wheelbarrow were used, it would take between 10,000 and 20,000 men with wheelbarrows to haul the same amount of material that we're hauling. Modern machines have made it possible to easily tackle mammoth Earth-moving projects. Case in point, in Southern California, the three recently completed dams holding back Diamond Valley Lake's 260 billion gallons of water. They represent the largest earthworks project in the history of the United States. Excavation began back in 1995. The entire reservoir project, including uh, the East Dam and the West Dam, which we have, is approximately 150 million cubic yards. Planners had decided that a new reservoir was vital for Southern California's future. Since the existing pipeline that comes from the Colorado River, 248 miles to the east, crosses the earthquake rift zone of the San Andreas Fault. Water engineers figured that one day the big one would strike and this vital supply line might be cut off. They resolved that this heavily populated and arid region required a reserve supply of water. Completed in only four years, the speed with which this new reservoir was built wouldn't have been possible without today's state-of-the-art equipment. This includes the water trucks used for dust control and soil compaction. We haul 20,000 gallons per load. And what really amazes you is the way that the uh, computer programs and so much of the systems are controlled by electronic modules and computerization where we can download information to tell basically what that, what that machine, the function of that machine for an entire 24-hour period. We never had that before. We thought we knew it all, but we, we didn't. To help break up solid rock, huge Ingersoll Rand drills created holes 45 feet deep, which were then packed with explosives. After the charges were detonated, a caterpillar shovel weighing 350 tons moved in and scooped up the earth and rock into enormous trucks that hauled it away. So every pass, he's putting 23 cubic yards into that truck. He can load the truck in a, a minute and 15 seconds, four to five passes, depending upon the density of the material that he's loading. Every shovel full of earth weighed over 90,000 pounds. When you look at all the large-scale earth-moving projects today and the amount of equipment it takes to get the jobs done, it just makes it all the more amazing. The massive building projects in ancient times, to do this without machines, it's just mind-boggling. Eons ago, earth-moving's earliest innovators fashioned their first tools, a shovel, a pick, and a hoe. The next step forward in the development of earth-moving equipment occurred when some unknown dreamer got the idea of putting boards together between two shafts to form the first hand barrow. Not content with this arrangement, another ancient inventor, probably in China, got the idea of attaching a wheel to one end, and the first wheelbarrow was born. In ancient Egypt, over 4,000 years ago, something resembling a sled was used to haul heavy burdens. Round sticks or logs were placed underneath it to diminish friction. Now more dirt or big rocks could be hauled. Between 250 and 200 BC, the Romans used similar methods on their vast highway system. But the development of earth-moving tools was extremely slow. The same basic practical two-wheeled cart had been used by the Egyptians and was later adopted by Europe's medieval peasants and then early American farmers. The only real innovation was replacing or augmenting manpower with horse, ox, or mule power. 
Around the time of the American Revolution, earth-moving tools began to change. The Ames family of Massachusetts transformed one of the earliest and basically unchanged earth-moving tools, the shovel. Their modified shovel was four pounds lighter than its old British counterpart. Although it looked like its handmade ancestor, this shovel was factory made, featuring steel plate with welded iron straps. By the turn of the 19th century, the Ames family was turning out 20,000 shovels a year. As the century progressed, America charged forward into a new age of industrialization that would include earth-moving machines that no one could have imagined. Today's earth-moving giants are sometimes built on a seemingly impossible scale. When seen digging for coal in this European mine, operated by the RWE Power Company of Germany, these bucket wheel excavators are obviously impressive. But when they make an appearance in the everyday world, their size can seem even more overwhelming. Like the time this monster crossed a road on its way to a new dig site. One of the most famous behemoths was nicknamed Big Muskie. It was manufactured in 1969 for use in an Ohio coal mine and was nearly 22 stories high. This colossus weighed more than 150 Boeing 727 jet planes and was the largest dragline excavator in the world. A dragline offers the advantage of a much longer reach than a power shovel. Using its long boom and cables, it works from the top of an excavation by dropping its bucket down and then filling it by dragging it back up the sides. Big Muskie could scoop up 325 tons of earth at a time. And then, with a swing of its 310-foot long boom, dump its load 600 feet away. Design and built by Busira Siri, Big Muskie swung a bucket that was 220 cubic yards in capacity. Now, it's hard to imagine what is 220 cubic yards. That bucket was large enough to park two Greyhound buses side by side in it. Big Muskie used more electrical power than a city of 100,000 people. In 1991, after it had served for 23 years in the coal mine, Environmental concerns about the mine's high sulfur content compelled its owners to shut it down. In the years that it was operational, Big Muskie removed nearly 500 million cubic yards of earth and uncovered 18 million tons of coal. The basic principle behind the drag line dates all the way back to 1836, when the 363-mile-long Erie Canal was under construction across upstate New York. A new type of digging tool was invented by having draft animals pull a strip of iron that acted as a cutting edge to scrape up loose dirt and rocks. It was called a drag scraper. Around this time, one of the transportation dreamers who spearheaded the canal, Robert Fulton, also advanced efforts to harness the power of steam. His Claremont steamboat was the first to steam up the Hudson. Soon after, steam power began moving Earth as well. In the history of earth moving, there's a distinct line between manpower and animal power and mechanization. In 1835, a gentleman by the name of William Otis built the first steam shovel that would usher in a whole era of new machines. William Otis developed this new machine called the Yankee Geologist, was the name originally uh, dubbed onto it. And it's quite surprising to see pictures of that old machine and look at the modern machines and see how similar they are in overall appearance. Around the time William Otis's steam shovel design was finally put into mass production in the 1880s, other early ancestors of well-known earth-moving machines were being created. The same steam shovel technology was used in dredges, Machines designed to scoop earth from the rivers and harbors of a growing industrial America. 
It was the Foley brothers that hit upon the idea of using a team of animals to push a steel plate instead of drawing it from behind. This was the early prototype of what was later to become the bulldozer. By the 1890s, the Austin Company of Chicago was perfecting a dump wagon with a hinged bottom, which could be used to quickly pour out an entire load. Soon, companies like Mack Trucks, founded in New York in 1902, and others were quick to seize upon the possibility of combining the internal combustion gasoline engine with the wagon design. These new vehicles would lead the way to today's mega-sized dump trucks. At the dawn of the 20th century, President Theodore Roosevelt spearheaded the construction of a canal across Panama, connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. As an earth-moving challenge, the canal was made possible by the combination of the steam shovel and the railroad car. During the process of that job, between 1904 and 1914, it required 102 steam shovels to dig approximately 255 million cubic yards of earth, which is just astounding for that time period. These steam shovels were made primarily by two manufacturers, Bucyrus and Marion. The transportation of the material was rail transport. They laid temporary rail tracks and rail cars were used with steam locomotives to haul the material away from the major cuttings. And uh, as we all know, the uh, canal opened uh, on time in 1914 and it's been a major seaway ever since. At the time the canal was being dug, a major breakthrough occurred in the farmlands of California. Agricultural equipment manufacturer Benjamin Holt came west in 1883 and set up shop in Stockton, California. His lifelong rival, Daniel Best, was a gold miner, hunter, and miller who tramped all over the west before settling in San Leandro. Both men realized that unlike the flat plains of the Midwest, California's topography called for an improved combine that could bring more marginal land under cultivation. Holt came up with a new kind of side hill harvester. Best picked up the challenge, and soon the two were locked in a contest to see who could turn out the most gargantuan machine. As their rival machines went into action, they boosted wheat production by millions of bushels. The early tractors were, you know, just huge. You'll see pictures of ones with huge A-frames built and extended wheels, which, of course, meant that when you got those stuck, too, it was just a bigger job to get them out. Bigger wheels were no solution in the spongy soil around Stockton in the rainy season. Hold is credited with coming up with the idea that if you could have, like, a set of planks that just laid themselves down in front of you, spread your weight out so you could stay on top of the bog, developing the first track layer system. Holt and his men removed the wheels from steam traction engine number 77 and installed a pair of new track units. The date was November 24th, 1904. A temporary solution to a local problem would soon be multiplied millions of times. When a photographer said the movements of the new machines reminded him of a caterpillar, the name stuck and the caterpillar brand was born. Holt and Best, always rivals, now intensified their competition, each company perfecting its design to outsell the other. These two talented inventor entrepreneurs not only mastered the art of production, but also used new techniques of salesmanship to sell their machines throughout the world, launching a new era in earth moving. The earth-moving industry originally relied on muscle and now depends primarily on machines. But when the going really gets tough, there is another method. Explosives. And today, one that gives the most bang for the buck is ammonium nitrate fertilizer. Ammonium nitrate, it's AMFO. Uh, we use a high density called Fragmax, and we mix it with motor oil. Most people use uh, diesel fuel. 
but this comes mixed with uh, motor oil. This blast site today is probably used anywhere from 18 to 20,000 pounds. It was back in 1867 that Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel revolutionized the earth moving industry with his new invention dynamite. Dynamite, if you may or may not know, is nitroglycerin that has been a, it has been packaged in with a sawdust or something that takes carry the nitroglycerin, make it safer. Dynamite made it possible to move mountains. Alfred Nobel's explosive invention also quickly became an effective weapon. But this wasn't the only time earth-moving technology was adopted by the military. Benjamin Holt had invented the Caterpillar tractor for peacetime use. But its development was propelled forward by war. Even before America entered World War I, General John Blackjack Pershing used Holt's crawler tractors to supply his troops as he pursued legendary bandit Pancho Villa across the Mexican border. Pershing never caught Villa, but the tractors proved their worth as rugged cargo carriers. August 1914, as war loomed over Europe, British General E.D. Swinton proposed building an armed land destroyer on a Caterpillar-type tractor base. The young First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, was quick to see the potential of this technology to create a formidable new weapon. And the tank was born. The dictates of combat also accelerated the development of everything from large cranes to giant steam shovels. Entrepreneur Alonzo Pauling teamed up with German immigrant Henry Harnischweger to found a company that would profit immensely from selling their powerful earth movers to America's armed forces. Their company, P&H, would eventually become the world's largest manufacturer of power shovels huge excavators and hydraulic drills. War is a pretty good money-making proposition. You know, certainly Holt and Best got rich off the idea. But, you know, after the war, the markets got a little thin. Huge unsold inventories and canceled war contracts led longtime rivals Holt and Best to bury the hatchet and make peace as well. Within a few years, the two companies merged, but they kept the winning Caterpillar trademark. If you're a good operator, you would be called a, a cat skinner, which I think kind of denotes the popularity of Caterpillar equipment. There were a lot of other manufacturers, but, you know, when you say Caterpillar, that's kind of generic for, for any crawler tractor. In the 1920s, improved mechanization signaled a new era of American road building. Millions of federal and state dollars poured into new roads for the tin lizzies being churned out by Henry Ford and cars being produced by other automakers. A new generation of improved bulldozers, scrapers, excavators, and rollers changed the look of the American countryside. And as road construction boomed, these new tools grew in weight, power, and popularity. This is a Caterpillar 60, and it's, you know, this, this built a lot of America. It's the last of the big gas burners. Uh, up through the 20s. This one was built, I believe, 28 to 32. And it's, you know, it's very typical of earlier Caterpillars. Uh, big, low RPM gas engine, uh, simple, very rugged. One returning veteran, Bob Letourneau, came back to California broke and in debt. But he borrowed a whole tractor and began to design a new kind of earth scraper. With each refinement, Laterno perfected his scraper. Before long, he was making big rigs, like this 1929 High Boy, equipped with enormous steel wheels being pulled by a Caterpillar tractor. Later, in a major breakthrough, Laterno realized that big pneumatic rubber tires led to increased speed and greater hauling ability. So by the early 1930s, another wave of innovative scrapers and haulers was going to work. He didn't start small and then develop into larger machines. Very often, the first machine of a type he would build would be the largest ever built. By the end of the 1930s, 
America's earth movers would pave the way for the first of the nation's new superhighways, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Contractors' fleets moved 26 million cubic yards of Pennsylvania earth. This new divided road was a glimpse of things to come. Other, even more gigantic earth-moving projects were part of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. In response to the grave unemployment of the Great Depression, the new president was determined to use the government to put the country back to work. His administration oversaw a series of earth-moving projects that dwarfed everything that came before them. In a desolate canyon on the border between Nevada and Arizona, engineers were facing the daunting task of completing Hoover Dam. Well, I was a young pup, a young kid, of course, and I got to see equipment that I couldn't believe. A lot of it was made for that job and that job only. And it was one of the wonders of the world. It would probably equate with the, with the Egyptians building the, the pyramids and so forth. You saw these huge, huge trucks that carried not only debris and, uh, you might say, blasted rock or dirt, but they also carry huge pipes for the downside and in the intakes of the, of the power plant. It was truly amazing. Older style trucks were completely inadequate for a job like this. An entirely new generation of Mack trucks was designed with ribbed bodies curved inward at the bottom to withstand the impact of huge rocks. The company of Mack developed one of their famous trucks. And these trucks were chain drive, very strongly built. And they were really the first trucks designed solely for off-highway use, as opposed to the lighter duty highway type trucks. The same mastery of earth moving technology went into building the Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia and hundreds of new dams that dotted the Tennessee Valley and other parts of the country. No one in the 1930s knew how important the new dams would become a few years later. Without electric power, America couldn't have transformed itself into Roosevelt's arsenal of democracy. And earth movers would play an important role in the epic conflict looming on the horizon. With the invention of steam power, and then electrical and diesel powered equipment, our ability to move Earth and transform the landscape accelerated enormously. Earth moving equipment is big business. And at every industry expo, a new generation of sophisticated equipment is debuted. Behind me is the Liebherr R994B. It's, uh, it weighs approximately 300 metric tons. It has an 18 cubic meter uh, bucket on it. Uh, the major advantage of this machine is that it features all the most up-to-date technologies we have uh, in our large uh, series of Liebherr excavators. In 2005, the big news was mini machines for use by both professionals and do-it-yourselfers. These machines, powered, are no bigger than a wheelbarrow, but they travel on tracks, and many of these machines are designed to fit through just a standard doorway, but their power and their hydraulics are unmatched by a man with a pick and a shovel. Another recent innovation is driverless equipment that can be used in dangerous situations like deep excavations where high walls could collapse. Komatsu is committed to being on the forefront of technology moving into the next decade. For example, we've developed dozers such as the D375A-5 that are fully remote operated. So an operator can stand uh, 100 yards away from his machine and operate that dozer at that location. The radio control box is very similar to what you would find inside the cab. There is a work equipment control lever and a forward and reverse lever. It's very similar to what a child would use with a radio control car. The whole point of radio control dozers or radio controlled equipment in general 
is to keep the operator safe. Earth moving equipment is incorporating many innovations first developed for the defense industry, including GPS. In the past, Earth movers have played an important role in many military operations. Even before America's entry into the Second World War, its earth moving industry was gearing up for war production. Throughout 1940 and 41, heavy equipment was already being shipped overseas to the nation's British and Russian allies. American military designers asked Caterpillar to design a radically new air cooled tank. A few months later, a test model was ready. Soon, M4 tanks were rolling off the assembly line. This new diesel tank could use heavy oil and low octane fuel, an advantage on hilly terrain. After Japan's surprise attack at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, the entire American earth moving industry went to war. Earth movers embarked on crash programs, laying new pipelines, building war materiel plants and new highways. The Japanese forces on the move. Alaska was vulnerable to attack and invasion. The military saw a vital need for a highway to help resupply Alaska through Canada. Work began on the Alcan Highway, one of the greatest construction projects since the Panama Canal. The men who scrambled to build it dubbed it the Road to Tokyo. It was built in only two short summer seasons. It was a major effort, and they forged through swamps and woods and creeks and pushed this road through in a, just a phenomenal pace. By 1942, the first Mack trucks roared north on the completed Alcan Highway to Fairbanks. Earth movers proved indispensable in the Pacific, where the U.S. was island hopping its way toward Japan. The Navy Seabees gained renown for their ability to build bases and landing strips virtually overnight. This is an international TD-14. These tractors were developed primarily for agricultural purposes. Uh, one of the interesting things, or certainly lucky things for, for us in World War II, is this heavy construction equipment is readily adaptable. Uh, actually, there was very little change in equipment as it went onto the battlefield. The importance of modern earth-moving machines was dramatically apparent in China, where local laborers had to build emergency landing strips for American flyers, using the same slow and labor-intensive earth-moving methods as their ancestors. Admiral William Bull Halsey acknowledged earth-moving technology's contribution to the final victory. He said the four machines that won the war in the Pacific were the submarine, radar, the airplane, and the tractor bulldozer. By war's end, companies like Bucyrus Erie and Marion were manufacturing earth-moving giants, the likes of which had never been seen. The giant dipper of one of these shovels could hold a Chevrolet truck or nine men. With the demands of wartime production, Enormous new excavators, drag lines, and steam dredges were developed that dwarfed everything that had come before. And this was only a taste of things to come. Mining is often earth moving on its most epic scale. To unearth natural resources, fossil fuels, and precious metals, we've searched, torn into, and sifted through the surface of our planet. In one of Earth Moving's more unique operations, oil is being mined, not drilled for, in the oil saturated sands of central Canada. The important thing here is the bitumen, which is an asphalt like um, oil substance that is thick as molasses, but it's trapped in with all the sand and debris and clay and water, hence the term oil sand. This is mined by shovels and trucks. The excavated material is hauled to a plant 
where conveyor belts carry it to vats, where the oil is separated from the soil. It takes approximately two metric tons of oil sand to produce a single barrel of light, sweet Canadian crude oil. And there is a lot of it up there. The combined output of the four major oil sand fields found in Alberta have the potential of producing oil that is five times greater than the conventional reserves currently found in Saudi Arabia. Most of the truly gigantic earth-moving machines are manufactured for mining purposes, a trend that began more than 80 years ago. The very earliest stripping shovel used in coal mining was developed by the Marion Steam Shovel Company. They came out almost every two or three years with a bigger machine. And by 1923, they had made the world's largest machine ever to move on land. That was quite phenomenal because it was built in the days before the era of welding. This huge machine was built using rivets. This was quite a major breakthrough. In the years following World War II, enormous strip mining machines were manufactured. The biggest increases in size occurred during the 1950s and 60s. More than 40 years after it was first manufactured, a stripping shovel called the Silver Spade remains one of the largest ever built. It's the last still operational from the era of supersized giants. It was erected at a mine in Ohio for the sole purpose of removing earth and rock to uncover coal. Designed and built by Busire Siri, the same company that built Big Muskie, the Silver Spade has been one of the favorite big stripping shovels. Even though it was not the largest, any shovel that stands over 20 stories tall weighs 7,200 tons and carries a bucket that's 105 cubic yards in capacity is large in anybody's book. The length of the Silver Spade's boom is 200 feet. Its series of driving motors total 9,000 horsepower and are powered by 7,200 volts of electricity. One day, the Silver Spade will be shut down. It's inevitable. Its age is against it. And it will be a sad day when that day does come. Not only is it the last super stripping shovel in operation today in the world, it is the last stripping shovel, period. And when it shuts down, it will be an end of an era. Economic and environmental concerns that have developed over the last 30 years doomed the Silver Spade's fellow giants. Coal strip mining was devastating vast areas of Ohio, Arkansas, and other states. Not bound by any reclamation laws, mining companies had no obligation to restore the scarred landscapes they left behind. When I was a child in a small rural community in Arkansas, just a few miles out of town, we had a strip mining operation. It was a subsidiary of a large national coal mining company. Back during the Depression, you, you saw that as a good job that paid a dollar to four dollars an hour, which was a big salary, big wage back then. And they saw it in one dimensional, and that was pure economics. Nobody was thinking about the long-term effects of the damage this earth-moving equipment was doing. The problems with strip mining had been accelerating in the 50s and 60s in Appalachia, and yet it wasn't until in 1972 there was a failure of a dam that coal miners had built up on a hillside in a place called Buffalo Creek in West Virginia. And the material behind that dam all flooded down into the valley and drowned 125 people. Disasters like this compelled legislation it had a dramatic impact on the coal companies. Some major strip mining machines like Big Muskie were closed down. Mining companies also developed cost-effective ways to remove the topsoil, the layer called the overburden, mine the coal seam, and then comply with regulations to restore the land. 
Soon, most of the industry moved out of Appalachia to western states like Wyoming, where the coal was more economical to mine. Out west, different types of mining operations search for other buried treasures. Near Elko, Nevada, some of the biggest equipment on Earth works the enormous Betsy Pit Mine, an immense and very rich $10 billion gold deposit. Huge trucks haul ore out of the pit at the rate of 240 tons a load. The Mammoth Project's efficiency is enhanced by a variety of computer-coordinated equipment. Using massive pumps, earth-moving engineers keep water from refilling the pit, improving the efficiency and speed of ore extraction. In the last 15 years, the mining industry, in fact, has cut its manpower demands in the U.S by about uh, 80%. So we now only employ about 50,000 people to do the mining that used to require a quarter of a million people. And yet we're mining metals at a greater rate than ever before. Huge mining operations encourage the 100-year-old P&H company to recently add a new behemoth to its product line. This impressive drag line called the 9020 has a crane longer than a football field and swings a 100 cubic yard bucket. It moves on state-of-the-art walking shoes and sports its own built-in kitchen. Because of this ever-increasing ability to move the earth, industry leaders and policymakers face new challenges and new responsibilities. The new earth moving equipment gives us the opportunity to create bigger and bigger environmental messes, but it also gives us the opportunity to fix them. In the future, new technologies and the ongoing public policy debate will lead to enormous changes in the earth moving industry. In the meantime, the world's impressive arsenal of earth movers and the talented professionals that man them will continue to transform our planet. As it came over the park, it just fell apart. There was a fireman who actually was videotaping. It was anonymously left in our mailbox. If this tape is real, we will have the first recorded evidence of a UFO crash in American history.